All right. Welcome, everybody. Today, we're talking about sales prospecting. I'm jazzed. I'm psyched. I'm ready to go. Um, we have Mr. Michael Padone joining us. Michael, um, man, sales buzz. Seems like we've been doing business for a long time. Um, yeah. Can you just take a minute um, and introduce yourself? I'll quickly introduce myself, and then we'll talk a little bit of house cleaning items, and then get into the fun stuff. Michael, over to you. Yeah, sure. So my name is Michael Padone. I own a company called SalesBuzz.com. I've been a straight commission inside sales rep for, I want to say going on 25 years now. And uh, I just have, I, I teach sales reps on how to use the phone to be successful at it so they don't suck at it and so they have fun and make money at it. It's really the bottom line. I love it. I love it. Um, and I'm Gabe Larson. I run what we call growth over here at Inside Sales. Um, got some marketing and sales responsibilities. Inside Sales, we help companies build pipeline, close more deals using artificial intelligence. So today, Michael, we're going to be talking about um, prospecting for the pros. We're going to get into a little bit of this concept of cadence. For those of you who have questions, we want this to be as active as possible. So hit that Q&A box as much as you can. Um, use the chat feed. We're going to be monitoring that. Um, we want to make this more about you than it is us. Um, so we're going to jump right in here in just a second. A um, couple questions that I know always come out. This will be sent out after. Um, um, so don't feel like you can't, you know, if you've got to jump off early, you'll get a recording and we'll make sure you can get that. I do want to know who is actually in the audience um, as we speak. So if you can go to that Q&A box, do it now. Um, order the chat box and just type in your name and where you are from so that we can uh, make sure that we get all that. So I'm Gabe Larson. I'm from Utah. Um, Michelle, welcome. Clara, welcome. Gabe, welcome. Michael, I'm expecting you to do the same thing. Ed. Yeah, you got great. a lot of people in here today, I see. <laughs> Keith, Keith, welcome from Seattle. Greg coming from Chicago. Dave, yeah, we're just hitting the 200 mark, you guys. Uh, Michael Padone, Tampa. That's not too bad, not too shabby. I love I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to be watching that Q&A and the chat box. Guys, Q&A is more personal if you want to go one-on-one -on -one with Michael. Um, I prefer the chat just open and honest. You can ask your questions there as well. Let's get into it. Michael, um, I want to know right here, right now, question number one for you, what is the optimal cadence? I want okay. the secret sauce here, man. I want yeah. the one cadence that rules them all. So, so here's the thing for those of you, for people that, cause there's people use different wording, like sequences and things like that. So cadence in today's world a lot is, how many times and when are you going to be reaching out to a prospect, correct? Yeah. Like, so, yeah. How many times, what, what tools are we using? Yeah, voicemail, your phone, email, LinkedIn, whatever. When do we reach out to them and things like that? So the answer to your question is this. Everybody's looking for the perfect cadence, the one that gets the best results. And if anybody ever tells you they have it, they're lying. There is no perfect cadence. It's going to be different. This, this is one of the biggest frustrations that, that I see that's out there that everybody's looking for this easy button. They want the, you know, I get it. We want the, we want the least pass of resistance, right? Because selling as rewarding as it can be, can also be the death of us if we're not getting the results that we want. If we're falling, how do I want to word this? If we're not meeting the minimum requirements of success that we're after, sales is no fun. Once we hit that level or exceed that level, sales is the greatest thing in the world. And, and what I see a lot of times is people are always looking, well, how many times and what should I reach out to them and, and how often and in what way and what's the perfect formula? And, and, and to, to Inside Sales' credit, by the way, you guys have this cadence book that if you, have, if you haven't seen it, for everybody that's listening, I would do a Google research or, or I don't know, Gabe, if you can send it out. It's got like seven different kinds. It was a great book that you guys created with different cadences and different styles and things of oh, that nature. Oh, yeah, good idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys had that a while ago. I thought it was really good. But here's the thing. There is no perfect cadence. Uh, you, you know, there's going to be different. First of all, let, let's do this. So the, the first step is this. You have to realize there's no perfect cadence out there. It's going to depend on certain scenarios. So, ah. what, so what are those scenarios? Well, let's take lead types. The very first thing you have to look at when you're going to decide on, on how often and what medians are you going to use to go after a prospect, you want to look at the lead. And for starters, is it a warm lead or is it a cold lead? 
Well, and I got to stop you right there, Michael. Warm lead, cold lead. Give me the difference real quick. What, huh. What's the difference between warm and cold for those of you? Well, it, it depends. If you want to listen to people that want to tell you what you want to hear, they're going to tell you that a warm lead is when you do research on a prospect. They say, don't make cold calls, just research on a prospect. That's warm. And that's categorically false. A warm lead is a prospect that is raising their hand. So in other words, the true definition of a cold call is contacting any prospect that is not currently raising their hand, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do all the research you want on a prospect. That doesn't make it any warmer for them on the other side. Okay. And that's okay. That's totally okay. There's a lot of people that do research on the lead and then they have the confidence and they have the right information to call that lead and, and, and get the call going. Perfect. Yep. It's still a cold call, right? So with that being said, a warm lead is somebody that's raising their hand. Some of you that are paying attention and listening to this or will listen to this, you might have inbound leads, right? They fill a form out, they attended a webinar, they're asking for information, they downloaded a white paper, maybe they're submitting a proposal request, right? If, if we log off this session and, I, and my CRM and my email box notifies me that somebody filled out a, a, a price request on, on my site, I might call that person three times in one day. Yeah. Simply because, you know, they're out there looking and I want to get a hold of them. Right. So I might, as soon as I get that lead, I call it right away. I, if I get voicemail, I'll leave voicemail, send an email, but I might schedule a task to try them again in two hours. And then if I don't hear from them, then I might try them again at the end of the day. Got it. Right? Got it. Because, okay. because they were really hot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's hit a couple of these. So number one, I think we got the definition down. So we, we understand we're talking, when we talk about a cadence, you guys, today's focus is how we're reaching out to people. I always like this concept of a sequence of activities to increase your contact and qualification rates. Michael gave a good definition, but I like the point that Michael just made on, there's no such thing as a perfect cadence. You've got something different for inbound and something potentially different for outbound, or let's call yeah. it warm and cold. Yeah. And Michael, you said, potentially, and let's just keep double clicking on this. We got a couple people on the Q and A that hit this right. um, three calls in a day, yeah. um, even for a warm lead. I mean, is that something that you consider to be best practice or are you just pulling our chain on that? No, 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 no. I, I, if it's a notice that if it's a, somebody filled out a proposal request, for on my website and I call them and I get voicemail, I'll leave voicemail, I'll send an email and then I'm going to immediately schedule a second attempt for me. It's still a first time call, by the way, when I try them again, it's just a second attempt, first time call. Okay. I'll try it again like two hours, depending on the day. I mean, if the warm lead comes or if that type of hot lead comes in at the end of the day, it's a different story, right? Yep. But if I get it, you know, before noon, I'm going to try in mid afternoon. And then if I still don't hear from when I call the second time, I'll probably get the gatekeeper to do it, to try to page them or say, Hey, you know, they reach out to me. I'm trying to get back to them. I'm going to be, you know, uh, in a meeting later this afternoon. Do you know if they're available? Hold on a second. And I get that whole thing going. And if they come back, they're still not available. Then I will try them again one more time at the end of the day, just because they raise, listen, if they raise their hand like that, I'm not the only person they probably Google to find a solution for. They could be talking just, to my competitors. I'm, I'm so glad you talked about this, guys, and this is important. And keep the questions coming um, either in the Q&A or the chat. I promise I'll get to them. I think sometimes on Cadence, and this is a sales rep thing, we often get scared like we're bugging them too much. But you raised an important point. When they came to you and said, I want to talk to you or, I, again, I'm interested, hey, it's your job to try to get – get back to them and get them on the line. So yeah. that's a pretty aggressive concept. But I think oftentimes, especially on inbound, we don't go aggressive enough. We go with this once every five days for four weeks. And it's like, what? They've already they, bought. They're interested, right? Yeah. The chances are if it's, if it's a warm or hot lead, if it's a hot lead, like an inbound hot lead like that, and every five days, they probably already bought or they got, or they cooled off. Now let, let's flip to the other side. If your job is to do outbound prospecting, hopefully you know how to pick your zebras out of the herd first. Yes. Right. Exactly. In other words, you know how to, you're not just, I, I got to go on a rant here. Uh, I had somebody reach out to me this morning on LinkedIn I accepted their request. Two seconds later, I got this long sales pitch about stuff I don't even know what he's talking about. Yeah. Right? And I'm not even qualified for that. So hope, when I say know how to pick your zebra out of the herd, hopefully you know what your, your what I call KPIs are, your key prospecting indicators. So you go, hey, this prospect, if they have this, this, and this, they're at least qualified to be a suspect. So let's just get right. the basics out of the way. Yep. You got your basic list, you know they're suspects, but they're cold. They didn't, read, they didn't raise their hand, they didn't reach out to you. I would not call them three times in one day because now that's harassment, 
right? You see the difference? Yeah. If it's a hot lead, they ask for a proposal, I want to reach out to them, you know, a couple of times in that one day to try to get them because they're going to be, they're talking to my competitors. I want to get on that radar. If it's a cold lead, there's all kinds of different, uh, you know, cadence that are out there. And, and, and again, there's not a perfect one, uh, but I have a couple that I think I can share that your audience would yeah, like. Yeah, so let's get let's get to that in just a minute. A couple people want us to get to the secret sauce, but you got to tune in to get his goods here, you guys. Uh, stick around. Um, you talk about the zebra. I actually read that. What was that called? There was a book about that, right? It was, it was a long time ago. The phrase stuck with me. I used a different term at the time, but the phrase really stuck with me. I forget which book it is. I, I, I read a book every week. So it's like, you know, I, I <laughs> What's the book of the, what, what's the favorite, what's your favorite book you're reading right now? Or a, a recommendation for the audience. You know, I, I, I just finished, uh, well, there's two of them. Uh, one was a political book, because so I'll just save everybody so we don't have half the people yelling. <laughs> yeah, right? don't but, do that. Don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> right? But, but that, was, that was a good one. But, but, but the other one, believe it or not, I just finished. It was called, called Blood Money, I think it was. It went about the, girl, the CEO in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley who was lying and built that whole billion-dollar company. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I forget. the name's escaping me of her, her name, but she was on the cover of Forbes and everything. Oh, we'll put, if anybody knows what he's talking about, put it in the chat, and if we can. Yeah, Ther Theranos, yeah, they, Alexia just said Theranos. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Theranos, nice, thank, yeah. thank you. It was a fa fabulous was Alex yeah, Alex yeah. I love to read these things. <laughs> I love to learn from people, even if they built it and failed. I mean, I loved her persistence. I love her belief, but yeah, she crossed the line. But, you know, I'm always, I'm always reading, you know, business books and things of that nature. Awesome. Awesome. Now I've got us detracted from our actual conversation. Exactly. Good job. Um, the zebra concept, though, because I do like, I feel like this is often marketing people are so much better at this. And look, I'm a marketer and I hate it. I try not to act like I am, but I've got some marketing blood in me, mostly because I have a marketing team under me at the moment. But that aside, marketing people often are a little better at thinking of target audiences. And then once yeah. they've got an audience, a zebra, if you will, then they create the messaging. Oftentimes, salespeople were kind of like, hey, man, let's just shoot from the hip. Let's just start calling whatever people are in front of me. And we forget that. And so I don't want to go spend too much time on it. But this zebra concept, any tips, tactics, or thoughts on making yeah. sure that you're, you get a target audience and then aligning your cadence to that? I'm, I'm going to tell you something. This is when I learned to become top of the top sales reps right yeah. here is because I was always a strong closer. Yeah. And, but if you didn't have a, an interested body in front of me, I couldn't close. And then I had, I had a VP says, well, you're basically just a glorified, you know, order taker. And that way I was deeply offended. And I'm like, I'm a strong closer. Well, yeah, but you're not but only if we're bringing you warm leads. And I was like, okay. And then he's told, I hated, I hated to prospect because my idea with prospecting was, you know, let's go way back where the, the traveling salesperson, he knocks on your door, you open it and he throws dirt on there and he starts vacuuming it. Right. I mean, that was like my idea of prospecting. You just go to anybody and everybody. Right, right. And he, he taught me the secret to prospecting that as the light bulb went on and then I loved picking up the phone. Sure. I would build my list and I, not only do I have strong closing skills, but now I had the front end and then it, I didn't have to, sorry, I know you're a marketing guy. I didn't have to rely on guys like you because I knew I could do everything from start to finish. So let's talk about that secret real quick. Yeah. It's so simple. Go, it's so do simple. It. All right. You have every industry, if you're selling a product or a service, you're going to have key markers that will pre identify suspects. Hence yep. your zebra out of the herd. It is so simple when you think about it this way. The biggest problem that most salespeople or even entrepreneurs, if they're starting their own business, like you know, somebody such as myself has a small business, things of that nature, we, we go wide instead of deep. A lot of salespeople go wide instead of deep. They're like, they'll chase every prospect down because they don't want to lose that one sale. But you know what? These types of leads might not have a high percentage. These over here might be way outside of your realm. You got to find that narrow valley and just go deep into it. So example for me, let me just give everybody a real world example. When I look at a lead, first of all, my pre-call planning research, how, how long do you think it should take to do research? Uh, wait, 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 hold on. Before you answer that, how long does the average sales rep that you've seen do pre-call research? Oh yeah. Let's, let's throw it out to all the group here. How long do people typically spend doing pre-call research if they're doing it how long do they think how, what are they doing in the real world we got david saying four minutes uh there we go dave five minutes 30 minutes jamie uh, 30 Kevin, minutes there you ben, go 
Yeah, yeah. five minutes for Julian Keith, five, two Google screens. <laughs> there's so there's so many sales reps that will do 10 to 30 minutes of research and they're basing it off of a book they read or whatever but really what it is they're hiding behind call reluctance times. yeah I, it, it, it should be two minutes or less to do research so let me do, when i get a lead i might pre call research. Michael, i gotta stop you just real quick because we did ask guys just in case you're wondering michael i don't know if you've got an actual stat on your side, but we threw out a survey to a thousand companies and asked them what their sales development reps are doing. 17.4 minutes per account is what we heard from our survey of 1200 companies. So I just did want to Mike back, back that with Michael. Um, Cause I do That's think crazy. we're spending a lot of, lot, lot of time. So you're saying two minutes, Michael's where you'd go, huh? It's two minutes or less when I do a research, but I know what I'm looking for. So I don't care where they went to school. I don't need to know about whether kids play sports or whatever, because that's not, unless I'm, what I, I solve is related to that, none of that matters. When I do research, first of all, I have the lead pulled up. I automatically have LinkedIn. I have the app that pulls into the CRM that pulls their profile in right away. I look at their titles the first thing. Okay. Right now, the thing is, is I don't base them. I don't determine if they're a decision maker based on their title alone. You can't do that. Okay, now we can, that's a deeper conversation. Yeah. But I do know that if they have a certain title, I can at least start the conversation with them. Uh, so they have to have the right title: VP of Sales, Sales Director, uh, yes. Yes. Sales yeah. Business Development. What for me personally, right? What industry are they in? I know my top ten industries like the back of my hand. Okay, yeah. that I sell. What location are they in? U.S., Canada, perfect. That, that's, that's, that's my playing field. So I narrow this all company size. You know, yeah. what type of product are they selling? Within two minutes, I can look at a LinkedIn profile, scan it. If I have to go to their website, not, that's fine. I can get all this done. And if they're in my, if they're in my wheelhouse, I market them as clean. Yeah. I market yeah. them as – well, here's the thing, everybody, by the way. I do not call it right away. If I'm cold prospecting – I will go through my list and I will tag each one, yeah. and put them in a clean. And then once I'm done going through that list, now I have my clean list. Now I knock the calls out. Yeah. The other way is I hunt for a lead and then I call it. And then I got to research. Oh, and I'm so glad you said that. I'm so, that. That's so powerful. Guys, for us, I just want to add to Michael's thing. Michael and us, it's one of the reasons I like talking to Michael's. We share a same audience. The only difference we do for our target is our technology, our sales acceleration technology sits on the Salesforce Dynamics or SAP platform. And so I go after, I, we build our list the same way Michael does and we'll try to then add on that CRM component. But once you've got a hundred names and I wanna make sure you heard that, don't hunt and peck, you know, hunt, shoot a bullet, hunt, shoot a bullet. Get those hundred names, get 50 people, then get in your mojo and start hitting them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's right. Because then you can kind of get that flow going. And if, you, if you're not a sports person and you're in sales, in sports, you get your mojo. You start filling it. You start making three-pointers. You're filling the groove. you yep. got to find that rhythm in sales. And if you're always hunting and pecking, you just won't find I want to double down on that, Michael. I think that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's so we good. got target audience nailed down. And, guys, I think that's some important points on that. Because if you don't take anything from this, man, it's all about the leads. It's you got to have the right people. You can give me, Michael, crappy salespeople with good leads. I'll make you money. You give me crappy leads with bad salespeople, I got nothing for you. Exactly. You have to have good leads. Now, a couple questions coming in. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get to this in a minute, but quick thoughts on scripts coming from yeah, I see. I see that. I see Jim asking that. So you have to have scripts. I'm sorry. Everybody says don't have scripts. You can't oh, script. Oh, oh, oh. Them, are, them are fighting words, Michael. Those so are well, fighting words, man. Well, I'm the one. Listen, all I can say is this. I've built and sold companies, seven-figure companies. I have no college background. Never even went to college. I know how to sell. And I built a company in marketing before and then sold it for a seven-figure deal. And that was in the middle of the dot-com bomb. And that was only successful because I knew how to sell and I mapped my process out. I hired people, taught them to follow this process. Yeah. And once they followed it, we made money. Yeah. Same thing when I teach other people. So let me ask you a question. Because for those of you that don't want to use a script, let's say you built your list. Let's say you have 20, you have 20 people that met, made it to your final list. And now you're going to call them. Are you going to say something different every stage, every step of the way on all 20? You're going to come up with 20 best ways to reach out to them? No. No. The problem was, here's the thing. We all agree that there's a lot of sales scripts out there that create more problems than they, than they solve. I'll give, I'll give everybody that. 
However, you have to understand the, the default for salespeople says, well, I don't want to sound like a script. Well, guess what? Every, every Oscar winning actor and actress had a script. They just didn't make it sound like one. You have to have the framework for the sales call. And there's too many caps and wingets out there that think they're yeah. slick willies. And then one month they hit their quota, next month they don't. And it really depends on how good the quality of the lead was. They were a glorified order taker. But once you know, exa I know exactly what I'm going to say to a prospect. I know the first three questions I'm going to ask them before I ever pick up the phone. Michael, we, we got to stop. I want, I want the opinion of the group here. Again, we've got more than 200 people all tuned in. I want an answer from all of you. Uh, <laughs> scripting. Do you agree with Michael? I'm going to throw some tomatoes. Feel free, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. I'm big. I can take let, it. Let them hit him. Do you agree? Yes or no? Scripting. All you got to type is yes, I believe it. No, I don't. Um, I want to add to that, Michael, because a lot of people, it's so funny in the whole account based world, you know, we feel like sometimes I think account based, by the way, Michael means cowboy town, means no order, means chaos, means people do whatever the heck they want. Conversation for probably another time. But guys, if you want to be good at something, scripting yourself is, I mean, you know, nail, get your messaging down, get that script going. Um, and, and you may start to dovetail off of it and get a little bit different, but having it in place, it, a lot of people hang you for it, but I promise you'll sell way better if you get that script down, then go from there. And the thing that I think Michael hit on that you have to remember is in the era of personalization. Oh, you got to personalize everything, Gabe. You got to person, you got, and, and I'm getting things, Michael, where people are like, hey, I saw on your Twitter that you have a, a, a dog named Luna. And it's like, oh my goodness, dude. I don't care about my dog. Truthfully, my wife made me buy it. I didn't want it. Uh, <laughs> I would prefer that you personalize around the persona and not the person. Talk to me about my problem. Talk That's to right. me about how you're going to solve my pipeline problem. Because even at Inside Sales, I got big goals. Call mm -hmm. me and talk to me about that. Forget about the, the kitschy dog talk and, and the super duper personalization. Don't get me wrong. It's always fun to mix some stuff in, but if what, what Michael's saying is you got a list of 100 salespeople, let's talk about their problem, and that's how I think you can develop a script that works for them. And again, I'm open to a little personalization, but I think you go around the persona first before you get to the person. Now, let's see what some of these guys are saying. We got all these. Start with the script and then go to individual. Uh, so that's kind of what I was saying. I think that's where Andreas was going. Dan, elevators should be scripted. Rest of the conversation should be taken from your knowledge of the product or platform. That's probably true, Mike. Like, get I'm going to disagree with that. Oh, okay, okay. I, I have a script. I have a script from before I pick up the phone right, to Dan. the final close. I have every single thing. I don't leave anything in the chance. Let me give. Let me give you the perfect example. I'm more of a hockey guy, right? But let's just go to baseball terms. Daddy, he's coming uh, at you. A, a script. Well, I want to help, right? I want. I want to give a different perspective, right? Yeah, so the thing is, is, is the script is like I got to get to first base. So that analogy was like, well, let's just get to first base and figure out the rest. How do we get to home plate? Yeah. Well, the thing is, is, first of all, I can get to. I can. I can get walked to first base. I could bunt to first base. I could hit a single. I could hit. You know, you know, there's different ways to get to first base. Well, now from first to second, there's yeah. different ways. I can steal. Somebody could get a base hit. Whatever there could be a balk, right? So there's you have to you can't go. I guess my point is you can't go from 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 first to home plate, right? You have to you have to touch all the bases. And I break the sales process down into four major quadrants. You have your openers, you have your qualifying, you have your presenting, and your closing. And eat now in each one of those quadrants, there's little steps, hmm. right? But I know each step. The, by the way, if in case anybody's asking or wondering, the qualifying phase is the largest one. There's the most steps in the yeah. qualifying but I know how many steps there are in each one and I, I know how to link them together. So for, for example, I don't want to leave it to chance that I'm speaking to the right person or I found a hot button or yeah. uh, you know, what their time frame is or can they afford my solution? These are all questions I know that I need to ask and the problem is most salespeople, they, they kind of know they need to ask them, but once they get past the, their initial script, once they get the conversation going, they kind of wing it from there. And sometimes it works for them, and but a lot of times it don't. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. And when you get in the habit of knowing, I got to go through these steps. And as long as you know what those steps are, you can even get a curveball from the prospect. You foul it off. You handle it. But what ends up happening is most salespeople will make the mistake. They'll get a, a question from the prospect, and then they jump three steps ahead and never come back to cover those other steps. You follow me? No. And now they're now they're now they miss steps in this process. And the, the call ends, 
their manager's like, okay, well, tell me about that. And they said, it was a great call. They want me to call them next week. And they go, why didn't they buy it now? And you're, you're like, I don't know. Because you didn't ask certain questions. And now everybody's upset, right? Yeah, and, and we've, you've got some people who are, are anti-scripts. And sometimes, guys, I think one of the things we get caught up in is the verbiage, right? That's one of the reasons we've been trying to use the word more plays. Like, think about, again, sports analogy. If somebody runs a certain defense, you got to run an offense. If they run pick and roll, you've got to be able to maneuver around that. I think what Michael is saying is when you're approaching this type of defense, a VP of sales, what play are you running? You know, what, yeah. what, how are you going to approach it? If, if you just go in empty handed because you're a slick salesman, those days are gone. A well-oiled machine in all sports knows what defense they're running and what plays beat that. And so I think Jim just asked it on here. He said, do you use core script or change it up based on persona? And I assume that is what you're saying, Mike. You, you do mix it up based on persona. Right? So, here, so here's the thing. My sales process, and this is, what, this is why people come to my courses all the time, right, is, is the fact that I actually will teach a step-by-step -step process is that I know the steps that I have to cover. But here's the thing. And I have my scripts of what I would normally say. The, one of the questions I'm going to ask, I call it the pain point question, right? Yep. And I have it written down on what question I'm going to ask. But right. the question I have right before then, if the prospect says something and they use different verbiage, I, will, I know my next step is to cover the pain point question, but I will change the verbiage based on what my prospect said two seconds ago, and I will use their own language. Yep. Okay. But, but the next step is still the next step. It's still right. looking for the pain point. So even though the words might be different on my script that I'll change on the fly, but it was because I'm actively listening to my prospect and, I, and I'm deciding in, in the heat of the moment, uh, you know, read and react to use a different verbiage that's going to be more relatable to I them. Love that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's you know, kind but, of but, but the steps are the same. Yeah, yeah. So you are. Again, that's the difference, I think, guys, in a full-blown script versus plays, because some of you are like, they sound too robotic. But a great salesperson, that's why I think a great athlete, it's like, oh, they just switched to the 2-3 defense, and they switch on the fly to run a different offense. And I think that's what Michael's doing. But they still, when the defense switches, Michael still is running an adapted play that he has practice and he's got good thing on. This idea that you can just always pull it from your back pocket it's just, it, it is wrong. Mike, we got tons of people saying, can you repeat the four quadrants one yeah, more time? Yeah, I saw, I saw them asking that too. So, so, so the four quadrants, sure, is I break it down as it's, it's your opener, your qualify, your presentation, and your closing. Those are the four main quadrants of the sales process, right? Like only, you know, first base, second base, third base, home. Right. And, and, and so the thing is, this is I know that I can't go from home plate to second base. I even listen, even if I get a double, I still have to touch first base before I get to second. Or if I even if I hit a home run, even if I hit a grand slam, I still have to you have to go around, and touch all the bases. Right. So it's the same thing in sales. You can't skip steps. Now, you can get to one step faster than the other. Right. You, that's where that's why the questions I, I teach them to ask. And we are way off subject, by the way. You're supposed to be talking about cadence. <laughs> there we yeah. are. Shoot, sorry. But, a couple but, of you are telling me. I promise we'll get back to cadence here. But we got a lot of conversations about maybe we should have done kind of how to actually script. We may have to follow that up. So. Right. But, but the point is, this is that, you know, you, you have to listen. You know, my, I know the questions we're going to ask. And more importantly, I know why I'm asking them and when I'm asking them. And most right. salespeople, they're so frustrated with selling. They love when they close the deal. But then when their numbers are down and the leads, then they start playing leads, the economy, with the competition, the pricing, whatever, what it really is, is they don't know how to target the right audience. And then they're afraid to pick up the phone. So they start sending emails because they read a book for some guy who sucked at selling by phone too. And he said, hey, just sell, send emails out. And the problem is now everybody's sending a bunch of emails out and they're not getting any, they're getting great open rates. And they're like, hey, my open rates are 50%. That's excellent. But open rates don't pay the bills. They don't pay your commission checks. Right. So you have to know how to pick up the phone. You have to have the confidence to and nobody likes getting rejected. So it starts with knowing who your audience is that if you contact them and, and you're going in with the right messaging, chances are, even if they weren't even thinking about you, they're going to at least want to have a conversation with you. You need to know how to build that list up. And then once you have it, you have to know exactly what to say to pique their interest in the first few seconds. Once you, that's your opener. Right. Once you know how to do that you better know what to say after you pique their interest. Otherwise, they're going to hang up. How, how many, everybody that's in here, how many of you have ever gotten a prospect on the phone, called them for the first time, they answer the phone, their enthusiasm, they're up here with you, and then two or three, you know, two or three seconds into it, and then you start hemming and hawing, you're not sure what question to ask, and you immediately hear their tone drop. 
Yeah. Does that yeah. ever happen? It's because you weren't prepared before you picked up the phone. You should know the first three questions you're going to be asking and why to ask them before you ever get the prospect. Here's another one. I'll give you one, then we'll get back to cadences if we still have time. Have you ever picked up the phone and the prospect actually answered the phone and it threw you off your game for a second? Yeah. You're like, oh, I didn't expect to get you. Does that ever happen? Yeah. That's because you weren't prepared picking up the phone beforehand. And, and you need to learn, what I teach my, the people that go to my course, I teach them this. One of the things is this, is that you should know, you wanna get rid of call reluctance, you should know the three things are gonna happen every time you pick up the phone. You're either gonna get gatekeeper, voicemail, or prospect. This is not rocket science. Yep. Sales is, a, there's a science to it, but it's not rocket science. And so when you know those three things are there, that's gonna happen, and, I, and once you know exactly what to say, the gatekeeper or voicemail or the prospect, and, and you know that you have plays and your terms that work at a high level, yep, yep. you won't be afraid to pick up the phone. Now the process is this, what do I say after I pique their interest? And that's where, that's where a lot of salespeople go, well, you can't script that. And I, I, I prove, well, I've proven 5,000 sales reps wrong. You, you know, that's how many people I've, I've trained the past Interesting. couple years. Interesting. So we yeah. got some feedback. So uh, I hope some, I, I hope, I, it sounds like some of you appreciated the detour, Michael. We've jumped a little bit off cadence. Yeah, sure. In our last few minutes, let's jump back here because I think some of these people are right. They actually came for cadence. But hopefully we, you've got some good information on how to approach actually your first call with verbiage. Michael, we talked about warm and cold. That's kind of where we left off. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the things you need to be thinking around target audience. Let's get into maybe some of these things that you feel like are good approach strategies as you go after warm and cold. Can you give us maybe one example of each, how yeah. you would approach it, thinking of different audiences then? So if I'm, there's, there's, I, have, I have two cold ways, right? First of all, I don't want to chase a prospect. I don't want to chase anybody that doesn't want to be caught. Right. So with, I mean, I see a lot of, a lot of these cadences where they're reaching out to a cold lead 20 times in three weeks or within a month or whatever. Yeah. And the thing is this, that borderlines harassment as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so the, the thing is this, there's two different ways that I use it. The one way is where I have like a 72 hour outreach and how this works is I will call. If I get voicemail, I'll leave voicemail and then I immediately send an email. Okay. And then I use a, I use a, a sales tool that if I don't hear back from them, if I say like 11.30 the next morning, yep. and, I, and e another email will go out to them automatically. Okay. It's a little bit of different verbiage, but still hitting the same point. And then if I don't hear back from them on the third day, by, by the afternoon, a third and final email will go out to them as well. So, you know, and it basically say, hey, bad timing. I, you know, I guess we caught you at a bad time, but if you ever need this, you know, here's, my, here's how to contact me. And so I will call, voicemail, email the first day, and then day two and day three at different times, I have a second, a third, and I call it my 72-hour outreach. And I get really great results with that because I'm already on to the next one. My, my theory is this. If I call and I left voicemail and I got it and I sent them an email and I'm coming in with, with my best what's in it for them value statement, I know they got my message. Yep. They could have been busy or they could not be interested, right? The reason why I don't just email only is because that could get caught into a spam folder. But when I leave a voicemail, I mentioned I'm about to send them an email. So even if they don't see it, they look in the spam folder and then they catch it and then they'll reply back to you. Or sometimes I'll get a call back and say, hey, I never got your email. So I will call, leave voicemail, send an email. The second day, I want to make use of automated tools that can get more done in less time. Yep. So that second day, the, uh, that extra email will go out. And the third day is one final one. I'm cutting them loose. I'm letting them know, no hard feelings. You, you know, maybe right now is not a good time. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there you have it. I know they've gotten my message. Why am I going to call them twice a week, every week for the next four weeks? And mm -hmm. obviously, uh, either I did some wrong prospecting or timing's bad or there's no need or whatever. I take that lead and then I put them back into my drip marketing campaign and I use marketing automation to let me know if they ever get interested again or if they ever go to my site, I get notified and now I can pick up the phone and call them because it's a trigger event must have happened. Now it's time to call them again. Mm. That's the process. Yeah. So Daniel just said, is it a 72 hour um, kind of a cadence and then at the end of, and then that's the end of the potential prospect. Um, but you were just kind of saying that you put them into your marketing campaign or marketing drip. Do you recycle them potentially later or at this point you've kind of, you know, one and done? 
Yeah, no. So I always will let my marketing, my drip marketing campaigns take over. Now my marketing campaign is different than a lot of some of the ones that are out there. A lot of them have pre-written, you know, funnels that they're going to, you know, with, you know, stuff that's out there. I don't do it that way. It's just mm -hmm. personal preference. I write a new sales blog, a new sales article every week. Yeah. And then, so I just put them on that. So they get something fresh every week uh, as far as that goes. So, so that's my strategy on that. And so if, if they're not reaching out, I'll put them on that list. You know, they, if they opt out, they opt out, then they're just done. That's fine. Um, and was this, was this a, a couple of people, is this for cold or was this for warm leads? You're cold kind of or warm. The, the, the 72 hours can be cold or warm. Now, let me just share with you my, so that, that it can be used cold or warm. I usually use it for warm though. Okay. Okay. My, my, my warm one because they were kind of raised they, it's different than hot right now we already talked about it. if they requested a proposal a custom proposal you write i'm three times in one day if i have to to get a hold of them mm. if it's a warm lead i'm going to reach out to them that way and then i'll do the drip thing as far as that goes if it's a cold lead i find old school is best school when it comes to that back in the day when i first got into sales it was one and done and i know that's a big no-no in today's world like why yep. do you only call a lead once and it was like listen if it's a cold lead, I'm going to call lead voice. So I'm going to send an email. But then what I would do is if those were my leads, I would schedule a second attempt 30 days out. And I would just do every 30 days with them, uh, like over a six month period, because it was, I wanted to make more, you have to make more dials on the cold than you yeah. do on the warm. And yeah. so I had to build that pipeline up. So for cold, I would do, you know, call voicemail, email, and then schedule, I would have a tool. I use the tool that automatically schedules 30 days out. If it's a warm, I'm going to put them in the 72 hour and then they get scheduled out. And then obviously if it's a hot, I'm going to, you know, contact them two or three times in one day, depending on the time of the, that the lead came in, uh, you know, to, to really get on their radar. Interesting. Interesting. A couple of people and Daniel hit this, you guys. And I think this is a little bit of a, I'm actually out to, to kind of disprove this at the moment, Daniel, or, or prove it either way. Um, we actually did a research study. Um, there, there's a lot of industry information out there that is subjective, meaning a lot of people have done surveys on what is, quote unquote, the optimal cadence, optimal number of touches. The problem is that's always been survey data, Daniel. It's never been actually done with real real data like um, actual number of attempts with outcomes, um, exactly. at least th that I've seen. So no Daniel and a lot of others who have read research that says the optimal is, you know, 12 to 20 touches. We ran a research study, the average sales development rep does about 15.4, according to them. Um, unfortunately, when we looked at our database, and again, inside sales, largest sales database in the world, hitting a couple trillion interactions. Um, I'm actually looking at a study, Michael, on cold calling to see if it is really dead. We've got a billion phone calls that we're going to analyze and see if we can solve that once and for all. But th that, that aside, when you look at um, what people are actually doing and then what is optimal um, from an outcome perspective, Daniel, and I won't go too much into it here, but if you want to talk offline, hit me up. Know that when it comes to inbound cadences, most people are doing about four touches. They believe they're doing 15. They're doing about four. Um, what we find is optimal is actually on inbound more in that six to 10 range. That's total touches. So think phone, voicemail, email, et cetera. When you move to outbound, again, most people think they're doing around that 15 range as well. Um, uh, where we find optimal on outbound actually interestingly is more in like the six range. Um, and that's looking at hundreds of thousands of data points, Daniel, that do say, if I can combine activities and I look at my ability to get someone to either respond or have a conversation or turn into an opportunity, what led to that? And so know that data does not agree with the so-called best practice of, you know, 15 to 20 touches. That is just survey data. I'm, I'm, I, again, we got a big research coming out this month looking at outbound cadences, what data says not what subjective people think so. But again, there's gonna be, that's just looking at millions of data points, your industry, your particular cadence. I've done one call, you guys, and, and had an appointment. I've had one yeah, killer totally. email that I've had a 50% response rate. I didn't need to do those six optimal touches for outbound. So know that there's some guidelines and I want us to get more data driven on cadence and less survey focused. Um, because, and, and Steven actually said it, most of the cadences um, that people promote are in that 10 to 14. Oh, you actually said inside sales are in that 10 to 14 day. Um, 
optimal cadences that we found from a time perspective did fall in about that 10 day range, uh, Stephen, to, to kind of your point. So I do think you're, you're going to find things that work for you. You're going to find things that um, data says, and then you're going to find things that, you know, research says. I think um, one of the things, Michael, you'd agree to, you got to take some of the principles, test them out, see what works for you. And I promise that cadence will, will be best. Yeah, well, it just goes back to what we first started. There is no perfect cadence. It doesn't exist. It's going to depend on certain scenarios. Now, but also for everybody that's listening, you got to realize when I call uh, on my very first attempt, I call a lead, whether it's cold, warm, or hot, doesn't matter. I call, leave a voicemail, send an email. That's three touches. That counts as three, right? So yeah, then, if I, right. then if I do my 72-hour, I have a couple of different variations of the 72-hour. Uh, so the simple one is call, voicemail, email, day one. Day two is email. Day three is a final email. That's five touches. Uh, the other time, I could get nine out of them because there's other times where I will call voicemail email. And for a particular type of lead, I'll have it in the afternoon. The next day, call voicemail email. Now I'm up to six. And then the same thing with the third day, I could do call voicemail email, and that's up to nine. Right? Yeah. So there's, it really, there's really other different ways that, that you can do it. That's why there's, I think what people need to realize is they have to identify who their real target audience is sharpen their message, know exactly what to say to pique their interest, and then know what to say once to get the, how to get the sales conversation going, and then just pick a cadence based on that type of lead and just go with it. Start picking yes. up the phone. Don't be afraid to yeah. pick up the phone, leave a message, send an email, rinse and repeat, because that's where the money is. So let, let's go. I know our time is over, guys, and if you have to jump, that's fine. Me and um, <laughs> Michael will just continue to check. Great questions, Dave. Um, Yes, we definitely use um, dialers. InsideSales.com has one. If you haven't heard, feel free to check it out. I had to take that one. It was too much of a good plug, Michael. One more cadence. So we hit the 72 and we kind of dissected that. And again, people seem, you know, strong, weak. Some people like it, don't like it. Have you found something else that you've found, again, with your audience that you've liked? Maybe a slightly different scenario that you could take us through? Well, hold on. I do want to answer one question. I see oh. if, if I'm okay. I see one of these questions. Patrick says, well, calling a voicemail is one touch, not two. And I kind of got sidetracked with that oh. for a second. So, oh, but yep. here's the, so, so I just want to share my viewpoint of why I count it as two rather than one is yeah. because I don't always leave a voicemail when I call. Right. So as far as my outreach, my attempts, that was one, that's one attempt. I didn't get them on the phone or if I did get them on the phone, there's no need for a voicemail. So either way, that's my output that I'm having. There are going to be times in the cadence that I have where it'll say call, no voicemail, no email, because I don't want to, I don't want to bombard them again, no perfect cadence. There's certain yeah. types of leads that I'll have where I already know that I've called voicemail email. Maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this just like in the hot lead. I, if I call them three times in one day, I don't send, I don't do call, voicemail, email, call, voicemail, email, call, voicemail. I don't try nine attempts or nine touches in one day. I'll call, voicemail, email. I'll try them later. If I get voicemail again, I may leave a message, hey, just follow up from the earlier. And then if I try them the third time, I might opt to not send an email or send a, uh, I'll leave a voicemail. So that's why the call is one, voicemail is another one. Hopefully that makes sense to Patrick. So with that being said, all right, I, I don't know if we have time for your question, but I, I got sidetracked with that because I, I thought that was a good point that Patrick had. So I just wanted to clarify or share yeah. my point. That, that, that is interesting. And Patrick, if you have some thoughts on that, you know, feel free to hit back because I do. That is a debate. We've debated that internally a lot as well as, um, you know, should you, is a voicemail an actual touch? A um, lot of debate right now, you guys, on the different communication methods that I think should be included in a cadence. Um, video, it's very hot right now. The problem is video is actually included in email um, when it is in cadence. So a lot of people say it's not a, a, an additional touch, just the email is. So, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to go too far down that, but my belief is, look, if it's a tool, let's start talking about it. So when yeah. it comes to opportunities for cadence, I like this idea, phone, voicemail, email, social, direct mailer, video, text message, and chat. Those are all things that can be utilized in your cadences in one form or another. And if you're not thinking about them, maybe you should. I'm not going to be the guy who says cold calling is dead. I've seen it work too many times, but you won't see me just cold calling all day. I am a believer in this multi-channel approach and obviously finding 
what works for you. Michael, we got, we got Jack. Jack kept, uh, had a, multiple questions, and Jack, we might need to hit this offline, but talking about GDPR, Canadian email laws, people who are outside of the United States who um, this kind of cold outreach or prospecting doesn't work as well. Um, how, any guidance, you know, I mean, Jack and I were kind of going back and forth on Canadian email laws. I don't know if we want to dive specifically into that, but for people who are in different countries with different laws, do you coach or any thoughts on that? Well, the, it goes back to your thing is, is that your target market or is that you get some deals there? Like the U S is my target market. Canada is the second one, yes. right? So yeah. with that being said, you got to, you have to understand that first. The second thing is this is, well then to avoid this, then instead of just randomly contacting people, do a little market, uh, uh, you know, um, marketing out there where you attract them to you to get them to opt in for yeah. your stuff. And you just solve the problem. Right. Yeah. So you just solve the problem that way. You do a webinar such as this shows them how to solve something for your own industry. They sign up and then you send them the email, the recording, and the, you, know, you have that little thing that agrees that they agree to get something if they accept it and, and use the tools that opt in and opt out and all that stuff. And you're fine. I do want to, before we, come, I saw one other question that came in. Somebody was asking as an example of an opening value statement that I would use. Mm -hmm. so, so, so let me give you guys a bad example. You guys ready? So I'll use my own industry, right? So let's say I just call somebody out of the blue and I go, Gabe, hi, this is Michael with yep. Sales Buzz and, and we, we provide sales training, online sales training. And I, I wanted to get on your calendar to see if what we have um, might, might be some help to you. Is next Tuesday or Thursday good for you? You know, and Gabe yep. probably responds yep. or something like, ah, no, we do it in-house. We're all set. I don't need that, right? That's the example of a bad opener, yep. right? But now let's say I do my research and I find out that Gabe's the sales director of a company. I do quick research. He's got 20 sales reps. If he has 20 or so sales reps, I'm very confident some of them are going to have call reluctance. Call reluctance is one of my specialties that I solve. So now I call Gabe up out of the blue and I go, hey, Gabe, this is Michael Padone with salesbuzz.com. Listen, the reason for my call, I specialize in helping inside sales teams overcome call reluctance. Mm. And if I caught you at a good time, I'd like to ask you just a few questions, see if what I have to offer may be of some help to you. Would that be okay? Yep. And then the next thing you know, I mean, I use it, guys, I know it works. I use it all the time and I get people that never heard of me before stopping their tracks to go, okay, I got a second, but here's the thing. Once you have a great opener and you've, that opener does exactly what I need it to do. It, it captures their attention. I got five seconds. And once I have that, I better know exactly what my next question is that's going to really engage them in a conversation. And if you don't have that, you're toast. So you got to have the whole, that's what I'm saying though. The sales script doesn't stop after the opener. I know exactly which question I'm going to ask next, why, and then what the one after that and the one after that and have that conversation. Next thing you know, we're having a sales conversation. I don't want you to have a sales script. I want you to have a sales conversation, but you have to know the process. Yeah. Wow. Um, you guys were so over some people, um, social media, how you focus on LinkedIn, Dustin, Paul, those are, that's probably unfortunately going to be a conversation for another time. Like guys, they're again, we text a lot of people asking about text. I love the concept of texting. I love this idea of um, e, uh, LinkedIn, et cetera. A lot of people asking about Canadian laws. Daniel, if your company's non-Canadian based and email away, if you're organized. So we may need to take that offline, you guys. Um, yeah. Again, we've been diving deep into GDPR. A lot of great blogs out there, but you do need to be careful. You've got to find ways to have them come to you more than you just going blindly to them. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, let's finish up. Guys, I hope that was good. I, Michael and I just got on. We, were, we did ramble. This was supposed to be a 15-minute thing. <laughs> we rambled a little bit, I'll admit. Um, but, Jack, Daniel, thank you so much for the questions. You guys, I hope it was valuable. We hopefully answered some of the stuff. A couple things as we leave. I'm going to share my screen. Um, a couple quick things we want to get across to you here. Number one, um, oh my goodness. Hey, you um, got the right picture of me there this time. Yeah, that's right. I made sure. <laughs> Michael, if people want to get in touch with you, that's kind of the best way to do that. How would you kind of gauge or guide them? Yeah, salesbuzz.com is my website. It has a lot of information about me. Obviously, LinkedIn's a great way to send me a connection request as well. But if I accept your LinkedIn request, don't send me a sales pitch two seconds later. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I've got some things on uh, email that I've been thinking about that I want to get out to. Um, Good. And then guys, two quick things we did want to throw out from our side. If you want to test your cadences, here's two things you can do. $500 value. We'll often charge people for this. We literally, you go to this website, you click on it, um, and we will 
send a lead through one of your lead forms and we will test your inbound cadence. We've done 200,000 of those. We can actually score you against a database. Again, you got to take it as a grain of salt. This is something that you, we submit a lead on your website. We track how many times people call or follow up or email it. Um, and we can benchmark you against, uh, I don't know how many companies, 200,000 plus. Check that out for inbound cadences. If you're more of an outbound shop and you want to test against our database for outbound cadences against what people are doing and what's working, you need to go to that website down below. Again, I'm, I'm glad Michael actually said this because sometimes people get confused like, hey, why do you have two different websites for inbound versus outbound? Unfortunately, it's such a different approach, you guys. We literally had to take it and say, if you are inbound, you go here. Um, again, lead response audit. If you're outbound, you go here, and that way we can make sure we benchmark you to the right database. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Michael, thanks so much for joining. Guys, tune in because Michael and I are going to be doing some more of these, um, just kind of random pick up, make sure we answer your questions. So if you haven't already, follow us on LinkedIn. If you don't connect with us on LinkedIn, we'll be offended after this because we're going to be doing more of these. We want to make sure you tune in. Michael, thanks so much for joining for the audience. Remember, success just one play away. Take care. Thanks, guys. We'll see you.